Hi, love bug. What you doing? Doing some astrophotography. What? No, you're not. You're playing video game. Yes, I am. But Daddy, your telescope is not outside. How do you know? Because I was just out there, but I didn't see it. I can't see your telescope. I'm taking pictures of the floor, Daddy. Well, that's part of it. No. Oh. Scoot over. I want to take pictures too. Well, I oh. can see why this would be confusing. When I first got into this as a hobby, I 100% had never heard of and did not understand what calibration frames were and why they're important. I'm going to show you a picture I took when I very first started getting into this hobby. And, uh, you know, if for, this was one of my early photos, so please ignore the stars that are out of focus and all the other technical problems with this. but. Um, one of the things you'll notice in the corner here, it is significantly brighter in one corner than in the opposite corner. This is caused from shadows within the optics itself. Shadows like these exist in every kind of telescope and they're always in a slightly different place depending on uh, the orientation of the telescope, what target you're pointed at, whether or not your, your camera is rotated and by how much. All of these things affect where those shadows are going to be. And the problem is, is you don't notice them right away when you're taking the pictures, but when you start stretching the images, those subtle differences really start to become more apparent. They manifest in gradients and other unwanted artifacts in your finished image. So our goal here using calibration frames is to get rid of those weird shadows. And the way we do this is by taking a picture of a, a pure white frame. Um, when I first started doing this, I thought the goal was just to make the whole frame totally white, like overexpose it and push all those values to 255, but that's not really what you want to do. You want to capture an image that's more sort of gray rather than white. And what that allows you to do is retain the differences in the highlights and the shadows that are appearing in the frame. What we're essentially doing here with this picture is telling the computer where these shadows are. It'll then be able to subtract those shadows and normalize the rest of the data across the field of view. This is the Spica Flat Fielder. It's a light panel that helps you capture your flat calibration frames. Um, it works great with my C8 telescope. All I do is simply uh, lay it down on a flat surface, uh, set the telescope right on top of it, and take some pictures of the evenly lit illuminated surface. But with the Raza, it does not work so great. And the reason why is that I can't lay the telescope on the light panel because the camera sticks out of the front of this. So from what I've read on the, uh, the internet, um, what most people are doing is they're putting their dew shield uh, on the telescope. They put the telescope on their mount, they put the dew shield on top of that, and then they put the light panel on top of the dew shield. And they, that kind of works for me, but the problem is, is it's kind of deforming my, my dew shield a little bit, and that's creating some weird little shadows that don't actually exist in my images. The Spica Flat Fielder actually has a little bit of weight to it. So with the Flat Fielder and the telescope and the camera and all the other gear attached, it's right at the limit of my equatorial mount. And I'm worried that the whole thing's just gonna collapse or something's gonna break. So um, what I would like to do is I would like something that can hold my telescope in an upright position, something that's good and strong and stable, uh, that's not my mount, um, and that it extends up past the uh, telescope a little bit so that I can put the flat fielder on top of that. I envision kind of a, a box that I can put the telescope in, close it up, it'd be nice and stable, put the flat fielder on top of that, and I can take my, my calibration frames. Um, so I've got some plywood and some other stuff, and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make a box to capture flats. So 
So I've attached the uh, camera and the ASI Air Pro because those will have to be attached at the time when I take my flats. I don't like to remove my autofocuser just because it's a, a pain to take on and off all the time. So we're just gonna measure it with that on there as well. We gotta figure out how big to make our box. So let's go ahead and measure this. Measure across this way. And then on the Z axis, I'm gonna measure all the way from the back of my autofocuser to the end of these wires because I don't wanna really deform these too much because they're in my shot, so I don't really wanna move them around too much. Look, so 12 and 3 fourths is what our measurement needs to be. Set our table saw to 12 and 3 fourths. Right there. Over the years, I've developed quite an allergy to sawdust, so we're going to uh, be wearing the respirator for this. We're going to set our blade height, turn on our vacuum. I need uh, a length of 34 and a half. The boards are 48 inches long. I've decided to give myself a little extra space, so I'm gonna cut off uh, 10 inches. That'll give me a length of uh, 38. Now I'm trying to do this project on a budget using just scraps and pieces that I have laying around already, so um, I already had to buy this plywood and wood is very expensive right now. So um, I have some hinges and things laying around in the shop. These are the hinges that I've got. So I want to find a way to make them work. I'm going to need to put this on a hinge so that I can open the box to put the telescope inside of it. But I also don't want any light leaks. If I put the hinges on the outside, then these holes won't quite meet the, the board here. If I put them on the edge like this, then I have to uh, drill into the, uh, the end grain on the plywood and that's not very strong so that's going to pull out. So um, the best way to do this in terms of strength would be to screw into the face and then screw into the face down that way as well so that this could open up. But that's going to give me a little bit of a light leak uh, inside uh, where these two boards come together. For the parts that don't have hinges, I um, was already thinking that I could put some 2x2s in the corner, put some screws in that way and get a nice strong connection there. So I was thinking I could do the same thing here uh, and that will um, plug up those, those light leaks. All I have to do is cut a little bit of a, uh, little bit of a kerf right there to accommodate the width of the hinge. So for my two by twos, I want to cut these to the same length that I cut the sides of the box. 37 and three fourths. Built this little collapsible <laughs> dust catch a few years ago. Stores away nicely. So here you can see I've just sort of set all the pieces together around the telescope. Nothing screwed in place or anything yet. So this is just a, a test fit to make sure that everything is dimensioned properly. Um, the telescope will slide back further in there to accommodate the camera in the front. But what we really want to look at is right here. So you'll see that the hinge extends past the plywood just a little bit there and that's not um, that's raising this corner block up and that's going to um, cause some light leaks and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to shave off just a little bit of that corner so it can sit flush. All right, our board has been cut so we're ready to uh, install the hinges. 
And for that, I'm going to use this uh, special self-centering drill bit. This is pretty cool. I got this one from Rockler. You can see that the tip of this thing has a little bit of a bevel on it. And uh, what that does is when, it, when you insert that into the hole, that little bevel guides you right into the middle of the hole. This little um, cover is spring-loaded, and when you push this back, the drill bit comes out just like that. So what happens is you line this up with your hole, it guides itself right in, and when you press a little bit harder, the drill bit comes out and puts a hole right in the middle of where you want to put that screw. I usually like to only do one at a time and then I put a screw in that. Um, that way the screw will help ensure that this doesn't move around. If you are using the self-centering bit uh, and you drill your first one, but then it moves around a little bit, then it obviously it won't be centered anymore. So the next screw, I put that screw in first and that will help ensure that it doesn't move on me. I'm using actually metal screws for this, which is not ideal, but they're the only half inch screws that I have available. Um, and it, they work good enough. Now notice that I'm putting this hinge on uh, backwards there. On the other side is a, a little notch that would allow this uh, a wood screw to fit flush. Um, but I want the hinge to be in this orientation with the actual hinge piece sticking out like this. And I want a nice 90 degree corner here like that. Um, and this is the only configuration where that will sit like that. Now that that screw is helping hold that in place, I can do the And now we'll do a second hinge a little further down the line. All right, so what we've got here is that uh, wood support that we cut the notch out of earlier. Um, and I've used a couple of clamps just to hold the bottom piece and the vertical piece to that support board. So that's kind of just holding that together for me. I'm going to put the screws in the three hinges and uh, then we'll attach the support board to the bottom piece. All right, now we're going to turn the whole thing on its side. So this is the bottom of the box. And I'm gonna put in a couple of wood screws into that support piece that we made. For this, I'm going to use a countersink bit. I got this one at Lowe's. Uh, this is a really handy tool. This is probably, I probably use this drill bit more than any other. Um, you drill a hole, uh, that's a pilot hole for the actual screw shank. Uh, and then at the end here, it's got this little countersinking uh, bit. It'll carve out a little extra around to accommodate the head of the screw. You just pull this collar out and flip that guy around when you're done. And now you've got your um, screwdriver head to actually drive the screw. There you can see how nicely the countersinking bit carved out a, an indentation for the screw head right there that sits nice and flush. You could drive the screw in from the back like this and then you wouldn't see the screw head at all, but there wouldn't be very much screw uh, thread going into this very thin plywood and that would not make for a very secure connection. So even though it doesn't look as nice to see the screw head on the outside, um, it makes it stronger and I'm not really going for appearance so much on this so much as uh, durability It's probably going to get a lot of miles. I'll just go ahead and put a few more in down the length of the board All right and a nice hinged door. Very nice. Butts right up against that um, support board. 
uh, and that support board will help prevent any light leakage. All right, now we're going to put the other wall on this side and another wall on that side so that when they close, the whole top part will be open here. This is gonna go on just like the other one did right here on this side, and we'll put one of our support blocks there in the corner. All right, we've got three of the sides on. This one folds up like that. Now we just need to put the top piece on as well. So the top piece is gonna go right here with another one of these wooden support pieces. And we'll put one more support piece right there as well so that when this closes, it can close on that. So this is just something for you to watch out for. If um, you can see that this board here, that uh, the sideboard butts up against the edge there and the sideboard butts up against that edge as well. So just make sure you're paying attention to that because I had accidentally not put them together like this. I had put them together like that instead. And so they didn't quite line up right. So I had to take them apart and reorganize it. I got one more support to put in that corner. Now for this last support, the hinge is here. So this entire part swings open like this. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that when this closes, it comes to rest on that support. So we're only going to put screws in on this side so that the support stays here. If we put screws in on this side, that would effectively lock the box closed and then it wouldn't hinge open anymore. So only screws on that side. And that now hinges open just like this. We can set the telescope right in there and then close the whole assembly like that. Um, like I said before, the wood's a little bit warped so we have to um, pull that closed to clear that gap. I think maybe if we put some little cam, cam locking uh, levers on there that will help us lock it closed. You wouldn't want this to come flying open while you're moving it around and stuff anyway. So some kind of locking mechanism uh, is warranted there. So I'm gonna seal up this end of this by putting uh, a little end piece on here. When I had cut these um, sides, uh, this was a, the cutoff end of one of them and it's uh, perfectly sized to fit, fill the, the end gap there. But uh, what I wanna do is when I put this in place, I put two more of these two by two boards, one right here and one right here, just to give me a little extra support so that that thing doesn't wobble around, especially when you're opening and closing it. I'll probably put uh, one more support board on this side as well. That way I'll have one on all four sides just to pre prevent any light leakage coming in from any of the corners. Let's go ahead and screw this in place. Now this is, uh, we're only gonna attach this to this moving side here. If we attached it to those ones, obviously we wouldn't be able to open the box afterwards. So a couple of screws here, a couple of screws there. All right, so this, this closes nicely, just like that. This end we're actually gonna leave open because that's where the Spica flat filter is gonna go. That's where we're going to shine the light in. At this point, what we need to do is we need to put in some curved wood or something that will cradle the telescope. The idea here is that uh, we want to be able to hold the telescope in place, um, close the box on it, and then lock our little locks that we'll put here on and then probably lift the whole thing straight up and put the spica 
flat fill the right on top so that it'll be standing vertically. Under the telescope we have this dove, dovetail bar and there's, there's this little bit extra that sticks out behind the actual dovetail part. So what I'm thinking is I can put some little wooden supports kind of like these uh, two by twos here and rest the telescope on that little flange that sticks out. So uh, the idea is it would be something like this. You can see how that little bit of flange is gonna sit on top of these boards. Now, if you saw my previous video about how to make your autofocuser work with the ASI Air Pro, um, then you saw how I like to mount my ASI Air to the Raza um, using the extra support plate that came with the uh, autofocuser. Now, these uh, two by twos that I was using just for demonstration here are actually too short. You can see that the ASI Air is actually um, extending out further than the the board is here. So I need something that's uh, a little bit taller than this two by two. So what I was thinking is I've got here a, uh, a two by six. I, I'm thinking that I can rip it down the length of this to make that however tall it needs to be. All right, so I've got those cut and put into place and the uh, telescope is sitting on that nicely. These are just tall enough that they lift the ASI Air Pro off of the, uh, the bottom, so it's not sitting on that. Um, they're, they're obviously too long, so we need to, to cut them down to length now. And now, don't forget, the telescope is in here the wrong way. Normally, we'd want the back of the telescope at the closed end. I've only got it oriented like this so that you can see it on the camera. What I need to do, I think, is to put some blocks in here that the back of the telescope can rest on because I don't want it to uh, slide down, hit the back of the box, and smash my autofocuser. So I'm gonna put some blocks in here that this can rest on. Now the thing is that um, this is uh, not a flat surface and it's got some contours and weird, weird shapes to it. So if I just put the blocks on here, it's going to kind of like rock on that. So I'd like to kind of cut the shape out. And I was thinking, how am I going to do that? And it occurred to me, I have had this tool for years and I've never had an opportunity to use it. This is the first time. And the way this works is you press this up against a surface and it uh, mimics that shape. So I can get a perfect impression of what this contour looks like. So I'm just going to put that right there like that and press it in. Get myself a nice impression of what that contour looks like, just like that. Now I can put this on my, my board and with my pencil, I can trace that mark in there and then cut it out with the jigsaw or the bandsaw or something. So these are going to be the two uh, cross braces that the back of the telescope sits on, the ones that I'm going to cut that funky contour out of. Uh, these are just scrap pieces. They're not starting off at the same size and I want them both to be 10 and an eighth inch long. Now I could cut these at the, uh, the chop saw, but I don't want to get it out because I'm lazy right now. So I'm going to cut them at the table saw instead. Now here's, here's a, an important safety tip. When you are making identical cuts at the table saw, you might be tempted to adjust your fence to 10 and an eighth inches and just rip it straight across here because then I could do a whole bunch of these and they'd all come out at, at 10 and an eighth inches. You don't want to use your miter gauge and your fence at the same time. And here's the reason why. If your workpiece is up against this face and this face at the same time, then as you're moving it, it can actually cause a little bit of drag and cause this to kind of wobble a little bit. And if it does that, it, the blade will pinch between the, uh, the workpiece and the fence and you'll get some kickback. So this is uh, not what you want to do. So instead, what you want to do is you want to put a little uh, stop block here with a little clamp like this. Now what, what happens is that you butt your, your workpiece right up against that, but as you move it, your workpiece will eventually disengage from that little stop block. So now as you cut it, if it did rock a little bit, it's no longer up against your fence. As long as you're holding it tight against the miter gauge, um, you'll be just fine. Just remember that this extra stop block is adding a little bit of extra width. So if you're using the tape measure on your, um, 
on your saw, you're going to need to uh, account for that extra width and move your fence back a little bit uh, by that amount. So first, we're going to find the center of this. I've pushed the um, little braces that the telescope sits on uh, back in as far as I, I want them to go. And I've got plenty of space in the front for the, the camera. And now I'm trying to figure out where I want to put the little braces that the telescope is actually going to sit on. I think that this is probably a good place right there. So I think what I'll do is place the braces and then have uh, a couple other bars, a couple other boards going from the brace to the back, and that's what will actually support them. Go ahead and cut those. I'm use this to figure out how far down I need to drill this hole. Okay, now I can transfer that to the other side of the box. I'm gonna put a second screw in there so that that doesn't rotate. Repeat for the top one. These are screwed in place, so now I'm going to uh, screw these ones to the box as well. Measure here, measure here, make sure that's the same, and we'll draw a pencil mark on there that we can line it up against. All right, now we'll pull out the telescope, flip the box over, and screw some screws in from the other side. All right, these guys are now locked in place. Need to have a board go from here to here and here to here. We've cut those, so now we'll pop them into place. This, uh, this support board here is going to uh, come up and take up some space here. So we actually have to push these back a little bit. They won't be on the extreme edge. They'll be back a little bit more back here. We are getting close. So I think what I'm gonna do here is uh, when I close this lid, I want the, the top of the lid as it swings closed, hold this in place from the top. One here on this side, one here on that side, and then we'll be done. I have some of this, um, it's that foamy, anti-skid stuff that you put inside of a toolbox so your tools don't slide around. Um, it's a little squishy. I think if I make it uh, double double thick, like double it over, and attach it to this, then when it closes, it should be just the right thickness to hold that in place. I'm going to staple it to the wood, but I don't want those staples to scratch the, the surface. So I want to make sure that I put the staples in the in the side because only this middle part where the roundness of the telescope is actually only just going to touch. I'm going to add a couple of pieces of that foam here to the back as well, I think. All right, so here it is. We're just Set that right in there. Position the dovetail between those two supports. Slide it right into place and then close up the lid. There you can see the pads are coming in contact with the top of the telescope 
just to hold it nice and snug. The uh, final steps, we're going to put on some of these little cam locking levers and I got a couple of handles too that will stick on there and then we'll be done. We'll get to test it out. These little guys are supposed to be mounted uh, like flush like this on one plane, but uh, I think I'm gonna mount it around the corner like this instead, just because going into the edge of plywood is not as strong as going into its face. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it this way instead. I didn't notice at first, but there's two different kinds of screws in this kit. There's the ones that have this rounded head, and then there's this one that has this beveled head with a flat top on it. Um, the purpose of this is that you can see the holes in this have this beveled countersunk design, and these ones do not have that countersink. So we want to use the flat screws for that. Here you can see I used one of the beveled ones by mistake and it's sitting uh, proud of the hole. So let's pull that out and use the right screw. I want to point out that these brass screws are very soft. Um, so when you're drilling these in, you want to make sure you drill a pilot hole first and you don't want to over tight them because you'll uh, you'll twist the head right off of the screw. Last thing we're going to put on a couple of handles. Um, the screws that came with this are quite a bit longer than the wood is thick. So what we need to do is make sure that we put this into some wood that is uh, like one of these backer pieces on the other side. We'll put it into those two by twos right there. So we've got uh, one of those two by twos going this way right here and then another one going right here. So we'll put our two handles right at those locations. That looks pretty good. Got a couple handles on top. None of our screws went off to the sides. They all went right where those two by twos are. We can lock that down, pick it up. All right, I think we're done. Let's load in the telescope and uh, see, how it, see how it works. That looks pretty good. So all we'll do now is put the um, flat fielder light panel on top of here and then take some pictures. I'm thinking I might add a little bit of that uh, squishy foam stuff to this top edge as well, just to make sure that the wood doesn't like scuff or scratch the, the light panel. Um, so I'll add that extra little touch there and, and then we're good to go. So what we're looking at here is uh, 13 minutes worth of 60 second sub exposure. So it's not a whole lot of data, but it was enough to get a feel for whether or not these calibration frames are, are really working or not. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm not exactly sure how the YouTube uh, compression algorithm is going to handle subtle gradients. So I'm going to apply an adjustment layer to this that is really going to stretch this to really severe uh, uh, amounts. Uh, and the whole purpose is to make sure that any subtle differences are showing up on the YouTube video. So here I'm going to really blow out my green channel and you're going to see that up here in the corners that it's definitely a little bit darker here than it is over here. This is without the calibration frames. So here I'm gonna hide this layer and reveal the same exact picture, but this one has calibration frames. And you can see that um, this corner here and this area here are now at the same amount of luminosity. 
also let's take note at what effect this is having on the deep space object itself. If I go back to the non-calibrated version, you can see that we're starting to lose some subtle details in these bright areas, but when I apply the calibration frames, I reclaim a lot of that lost data here in the nebula. If nerdy content like this is beneficial to you, then I hope that I have earned a subscription. And don't forget to leave me a comment and hit the like button as well. All forms of user interaction help the channel. I'm also now on Facebook and Instagram, so if you'd like to look me up there, I'll put uh, little links at the bottom of the uh, screen and in the description for you. And uh, clear skies. Mm -hmm.